All right. We are here with Grandmaster Elshan Moradi Abadi. Thank you so much, buddy, for uh, accepting my invite and uh, coming to the show. Uh, I know Elshan uh, uh, from back in Iran. Elshan was part of uh, Iran's national team, and uh, he won many championships in the past. Like he's one of the uh, very he's he's one of the prides of our school. By the way, like I gotta say, like we went to the same school, and everybody knew Elshan because of his achievements in chess uh, globally. And then there was this simultaneous game that you had at Sharif, if you remember that game, Elshan. And I was one of the uh, folks who played against you, like uh, of hundreds of people, of course. And I think that was the first time we met literally in person and we played chess. And I was just like, this guy, oh my God. Like, and with, with a couple of moves, you just beat me so badly. Uh, but anyway, that was, a, that was how we got to know each other. And then we, we became friends and stayed in touch. Um, I'm so happy that you're on the show, uh, and would love to kind of like get a start with this conversation, however you want to start it. And first of all, if you want to share anything with the audience about you and what you're doing right now. Hey, Alice, good, uh, good to be here with you. Uh, on a note on the uh, simultaneous exhibition at Sheriff University back in 2006, maybe or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Time flies. Um, yeah, I, I didn't win in a couple of moves. I don't want people to think that, oh, grandmas can win the moves but it was made probably a short game yeah time flies by time flies by so fast uh i'm happy to be here uh, i'm so glad that uh, over these years we've managed to keep, stay in touch and keep in touch and uh, being in friends uh making friends is always a privilege so keeping friends is even more important so i'm i'm so glad that we i'm here with you today and uh, let's have some fun talk yeah dude like i I want everyone to know part of your journey. I think it's uh, you, you took an interesting journey where you lived in Iran for a while and then you moved to States. You uh, you were part of uh, Iran's team. You coached the, the U.S. national team in 2019. How has that journey been? Like, Tell us a little bit about that part of your journey that I think a lot of folks may not know actually about. Yeah, it started when, from a very early age in childhood. Now, you know, kids start at four or five or even six uh, learning chess, so it's become a very uh, it has become an international sport for kids, especially with the uh, with all the gadgets and uh, iPads and you know all the tablets that kids have. So parents want their kids to have activities that are more intellectually rewarding and uh, and uh, in, in, in increases their focus and uh, an ability to uh, be immersed in, a, in an activity which is more cognitive. Well, that's that wasn't the case back when I started. We're talking 30 years, 31 years ago. Uh, it was, for me, a love on the first sight. Uh, I really fell in love with the game. And for my parents, it was a remedy that uh, finally my son, our son has something that he likes because I really didn't like so many things, including school. Uh, I could do my stuff, of course, elementary and all the way in middle school and high school and eventually at the university. I got through with them because I think just don't want to sound cocky, just I, had, I was smart enough because I could do that, but it wasn't that because I liked it. And um, part of it now I know is that I have ADHD. Probably that was that, that was the case. As, as a person with ADHD, I could hyper-focus on chess because I was in love with it. So for my parents, it was a great uh, relief that, okay, we found something that he finally likes. And uh, after that, really, it was just an artistic path. And that's one of the reasons that why... I could not handle the pain of uh, losing because uh, I was more of an artist in chess, more of a more of, more of into the science of it, the beauty of it, than the sports side of it. I, I always had a, and I think that's where the path we're taking for today's conversation. I always had a problem dealing with my losses because I felt that I'm intellectually unfit for the game, which was difficult to handle. And now I'm in a better place with it after thirty some years. But yeah, but it was it was a deep love and and the connection between me and the game. And uh, I can't tell, like, I was going to the alumni middle schools and high schools, and it was, like, the, uh, very close to the southern part of Tehran, and the chess federation was on the east, uh, eastern side of Tehran, and, you know, Tehran with, like, 10 million people and cars going back and forth. Every You want to go from a place to that, like that, it's 45 minutes, one hour drive, we're talking, at least. And I was finished school at 3 p.m., and then I would just, my dad would give me enough money to pay for a uh, taxi, you know, these... Uh, like the, we had to kind of do Uber style, style taxi we had, and then uh, 
get to the federation and I had to wait for two hours for the coach to finish his first session and then I would go somewhere and I had to get enough money to buy myself some some food and I'll wait there but I was I would so but the, I'm just saying is that the law was so much that I could wait three hours to just have a training session with the grandmaster and that was already at the time a privilege so I'm lucky that as a first generation of grandmasters in Iran had this chance had this unique chance of when finally the ban on chess was lifted by the Iranian government due to whatever um pause they had in during the uh, extremist era of the post-revolution in Iran uh, for whatever reason. So the ban was lifted and it was, okay, we, we can let people study chess. It was a bit of a better environment about, you know, let's do something intellectual. So the uh, foreign grandmasters would come to Iran and uh, it was, it was, I was very lucky about that one. Uh, the rest is history. I kept playing. Uh, when we talk more in depth, I will talk, tell about stages of, of my life with it. And uh, yeah, Became a grandmaster in 2005 and immigrated to the United States in 2012. Uh, but again, we will fill in the blank as we'll talk. Thank you for painting that uh, picture. Uh, it's lovely to hear the story of you so passionately getting yourself from school to the Federation, doing all those practices, getting to the place that you got to. Um, it's also interesting to see and I, I'm sure we're going to dive deeper into that. Like, while you've been able to achieve what you have achieved, at the same time, you've been dealing so much also like with the, the experience of losing. And um, no, I think that's the other side of the game that a lot of times we are not seeing. Like, we see the news and we see Elshan as like, or Elshan-like uh, successful folks in their area. And then we don't see the other side of it and the pains that they're dealing with that other side. So that's that's also like something I'm sure we're going to dive deeper. How was your experience as an immigrant coming to the States? Like, I know I experienced it as someone that I just came here to study and go to school and uh, get, a, get a job, get a life, get something better uh, eventually. But how was that for you? What, what encouraged that uh, immigration and how has that experience been for you so far? It's a very interesting uh, point to start. And, uh, you know, maybe I can talk about one of the, not one of the first uh, pains in chess I, I experienced, but one of the most unexpected pains I experienced in chess. And that was the pain of becoming a grandmaster. Because when I said the pain of becoming a grandmaster, I was like, well, what, what? You achieve something. People get PhD, they become happy about it. Because for me was that if, if like, the journey ended and I was very lost, it was very painful for, for a couple of years until I was back on the path. And again, there was another pain in, uh, hitting me. But it felt very weird. I can tell, I can show you this story for you. I became a grandmaster. Then my mom kind of threw a party. She was there with me. We was in Moscow, 2005. And then everybody went there. We had lunch and everything. And then everybody said, oh, let's go to this guy's rooms because they had a bigger room. And we just you know, chat and talk and you know celebrate. You know, everybody went except me. And it was just, I could not, I was in a shock. I was happy, of course, but I was in a shock. Now what's going to happen? And uh, that was the very first uh, thing. So um, that thought, at least for me, for for a while after that, I had an upward trend and I, something happened to me. I, I had a couple of car accidents, unfortunate ones. One of them actually, I was walking and some car hit me at Sharif University. I don't know if you knew that story or not. So it really affected my upward training chess and then I started stagnating my rating went down and all of that and my friends started leaving my friends from Sheriff University started leaving the country coming to the United States Canada other places so kind of it became pretty lonely after a while so I was I was a bit lost when I was immigrating so for me it was that uh, it's a very candid and uh, fair opinion and I don't mind to share it here that I really didn't like the culture in Iran so I just wanted to be somewhere else so that was a Western culture, because I've had so much interaction with Western cultures through the years, and I knew that, that I don't like the Iranian culture. I, I, I'm sorry if it disappoints friends who are listening to this, but I don't mind sharing it here. Uh, I cannot say to what extent I don't like the culture, but I can say enough that it, it, it was enough encouragement that when during my depression time, a very bad depression I was dealing with, I began the process of trying to leave Iran. For me, it was, was to leave the culture. Yeah. And then how how did that uh, kind of like pan out as as you came to the U.S. and migrated? Like, what was like some of the challenges here? 
knowing that was your intention for leaving the country, leaving the culture, like how has that been working since the beginning up, up to today? Like what are some of the challenges maybe you felt? Well, I ended up in a very small town in Texas and what in West Texas, which culturally wasn't really befitting to my uh, grasp of the world, you know, the the West I, I've seen was that I was in Athens and Paris and, you know, places in Germany and my sister in Vienna or other places. So I was, I was very close to the cultures and, uh, and cultural experiences. So for me, it was a, it was a big shock and, you know, studying for the sake of just studying was a bit of a, a, a difficulty at first. So, and then some personal matters happened from day one, things got a bit derailed. So my experience in Lubbock, Texas didn't go as planned. And although I finally got to the PhD program, passed qualifying exam, I couldn't just bring myself to finish it for, for so many reasons. And it was a very painful experience. So I didn't have an easy start, but ever since like I was back to chess, so chess has been my curse and my remedy at the same time. So it's the pain and the, uh, it's the pain. antidote both. Yeah. So it's the poison and the antidote. And at the same time, so back to chess, uh, been living a better life and, uh, COVID was difficult, but uh, chess again, helped to cope with it. Uh, bad things happened to me. Good things happened to me during that time. And, uh, I can say I'm in a, in a better place now than ever I was in the United States. So the past 12 years, things have been upward all, all together. Trend, the... the trend wasn't what I was expecting. Any of it, I wasn't expecting of that. But uh, I am in a better place I've ever been in my in my entire time as an immigrant. That's so wonderful to hear, and um, I can tell from my experience, like how there are waves of these problems and these uh, things that we have externally and internally to deal with. So uh, hearing that you've been able to over time like deal with a lot of them and being and feeling so great the way that you're doing just. As, as your friend, feels great to hear that. Uh, and also, like, I think it just brings hope uh, for um, all of us who are immigrants in general. Like, know that there is, there's always hard things to work on, things to deal with, and exact, start uh, knowing ourselves better through this experience. I kind of want to go to um, your experience dealing uh, with pain and the pain of uh, the pain that you described as losing. And to me, when I heard it the first time, uh, it was like, wow, this is so interesting hearing that from someone that I, in my perspective, I always thought they achieved so much. Like to your point, you, you went, and maybe that, that kind of like aha moment uh, for you was like, oh, I, I reached Grandmaster, what, what next? And for me, like that's, again, that's the picture we were seeing. We were like, this person achieved exactly what they wanted. and when I thought a little bit more about it, I'm like, oh, there's been also like times in my life that I achieve exactly what I wanted and then things started not sounding great to me. So I, I want to know that part of the story a little bit more deeper from you and if you, however you want to share that experience, however you want to share examples so that we can understand it better from your perspective and how that story has been for you. Absolutely. For me, I love chess. But as I said, I was not a good sportsman. I was the I was an, I was an artist. I was this. I was studious. I loved the game, but I was not as good as my as I could not bring my knowledge to the game. I would get nervous. I had anxiety. Now, now it is after going through many years of therapy and sessions and doing things. I know I have anxiety. I have to work on it. I'm as at some point I took medications. I might need to take medications again. But what, what matters is that I wasn't aware as a child I have these things. So maybe if I was aware, and actually my parents tried to help me. I went to see some psychologists in, in Iran, a child, but they were not child psychologists and I could never bond with them uh, when I was 12, 13, 11, because uh, computing was really stressful. It's, it's, it is not easy. And especially now I have this experience that was makes me a good coach, but I, I, I skip that for now and talk about my experience first. Uh, so it was my love that people out there saying that Elshan is not a good player because he cannot really realize 
the things you learned at the board. And uh, I became very vindictive and I had this conviction of I have to prove I can do it. I'm a very smart guy. And I think that's uh, very surprising for a guy who has anxiety because I have such a, I, I, or I had, I don't know, I think the longer we live, become more humbled by life experiences. But I had this, such a big ego that I'm going to become a grandmaster and everyone's going to see that how good I can be. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about people's recognition specifically. It was about that I can do this and I can make everyone bow to me for my greatness at the game of chess. And it was like, I was 12 or 13. And I don't know how crazy this was, sound, this was sounding because at the time Iran did not have a grandmaster. Like there was no, there was no story. Like there's no other one. Okay, uh, there was another player. He was good, and I could see he's becoming really good. But the idea of really becoming a grandmaster, really in a, in a professional sense, was when I was 16 when I won the Iranian championship. I was only 2400 federated player. I beat a couple of grandmasters at that age. But until then, it wasn't really a real thing. But already the idea of oh, I can, I'm gonna do this. And you're going to see that I can do this. And I even didn't know whom I want to prove it to because I never, I, when I, when I do things I like, I don't really think about what people think of me about those things, the things I'm good at. Uh, but anyways, this started there with me. And when I became a grandmaster, okay, I couldn't handle the loss and pain, uh, uh, pain of losing. I couldn't deal with the pain of people being mean to me uh, because, because, you know, it's a very cutthroat environment. This is, nobody's your, is your friend because your your loss is as others wins. No one's in it with you. There's no it's not a team game or it's not a it's not an environment. The longer we go back in time, there are less opportunities than now for people to you know there were this, these pockets of there were small pockets of opportunities which you know if you don't win this tournament you don't get the next one. So it's very stressful. So when I became a grandmaster, as I was saying, and the pain uh, dealing all these years of dealing with the pain and losing and everything. Uh, a relief at first. It was very hard for me to progress because I could not go back looking at my games that I lost. I had a hard time learning from my experiences. That really pushed me away from from progress as fast as I could. And I would always change my openings from the, from bad losses. Like if I lose a game and I just realize that I played the opening correctly, I would try to look for something else. I would try to throw it under the rock instead of going head on and say, okay, I made this mistake. I'm going to fix this. And the next time, if this position happens on the board, I'm going to play it better. I would say not all the time, but hardly ever I did that. You know, a grandmaster, a, a true, now I do this. A true chess lover goes through that and learns and the next time I'm going to do it right. At that time, maybe 15%, 20% of the time I would do that. And that was a very bad uh, approach. Nobody, nobody tried to teach me that, you know, learn deeply from your losses and mistakes because in chess it's very important. You don't learn, you get all these tools out there, but you learn the most from your own mistakes. Mm-hmm. And this unwillingness to deal with the pain of losses was a factor that delayed my progress in chess. I remember looking at the games with my coaches when I would lose a game. It was making me feel diminished and bad. So that was the, that was the, that was a very uh, unfortunate experience. And I wish uh, nowadays I use uh, with my students at least. Now I learned the lesson. I use the uh, Compliments versus criticism, kind of a go back and forth. I look at the game, I recognize their mistakes, I recognize, I, I pinpoint their mistakes. I'm extremely critical about that, but I give them a pat on the shoulder. And it's very hard. And I see working, especially with uh, girls, both boys and girls between 14 and 16, and boys above 10, it's not that easy for them to take the criticism. Mm-hmm. And because there was no precedent to our situation back in Iran, so nobody knew how to deal with these kids at, at my age. So I was a silent participant in something that was painful to me, and I was trying to avoid the pain or just throw it under the rock and just uh, just avoid looking at it. So that's the first experience of, of pain with chess. The next one would be, of course, becoming a grandmaster. Yeah, that's uh, very interesting, and thank you for sharing that. Um, as you were sharing it, uh, a few thoughts came to my mind. One is, it's so interesting, you, the pattern you were dealing with, like the pattern of making the mistake, we all make mistakes, but the pattern of putting it on the rug. But it's interesting, you came out of it now by, first of all, talking about it. I think this this just proves 
how much you are over that, like how much you've been able to understand that issue so well that not only you've been able to learn from your mistakes in chess, which is, is I know it's a big part of your life. I know you love it, but in your day to day, now you can also like even talk about it. So it just shows like it's been impacting, like understanding this pattern of the behavior that you've had. You've been able to go through it so much that now you can talk about it and sharing it and hopefully helping others who may deal with such things. I, I can say, and I mean, from experience, there are times as a product manager, simple example, there are times that I was launching a product, it was not going well. And I was like, so sad. Like there was just like this thing in me that we spent so much time designing this, like going through research. The initial feedback was amazing. We were so excited about launching this. And then you're launching it and then nobody clicks on that feature. And you somehow unintentionally want to throw it somewhere under the rug or just like, I don't want to even look at that project. I now hate that project. You know, like this becomes like this hate and love. For, it just made me, your story made me think of like some of those small moments I had, which I had to also like learn. It's so interesting, the paradigm. I had to also learn, hey, the best way to grow a product is to see what has failed before. So you don't make that same mistake. And it, I, I just love the paradigm for me. It, it, it really helped me to capture some of the learnings. Um, and the third part, which I want to go a little bit deeper is like how now you're applying that learning to the, uh, the team that you're coaching and the folks that you're coaching, how does it feel right now? Like seeing those kids sort of like making the same mistake. And now you have this opportunity to bring this back to them. Like, how does that make you feel? And what are the thoughts that goes through your mind as you're coaching them? Well, for a guy who has chronic anxiety, it's just stressful because you feel responsible for that. Because, uh, and, and if you go to the depth of it, nobody was around me to be aware. Now, these kids have the privilege of having someone to, to, who knows. Well, the parents expect only a chess part, of course. I know I'm getting compensated for that. But to my own ethics and conscience, I feel very responsible about it. But you cannot always pinpoint. I mean, human, I mean, we're different from one to another. We know that already. Sure. So although I see the pattern, doesn't mean that the way I approach it is, is the right way always. Mm -hmm. So it is very, it is very I was stressful. It is very, uh, it is very, it causes, it causes anxiety. For example, today at uh, 8 p.m., I have a meeting with a student who blunders. And I think his blundering has, is related to his psychology because he works on his chest. He loves the game. He is nine and he speaks uh, English like a 13 year old. So it shows he's a very smart kid, but he blunders. He just makes um, beginner's mistake sometimes in the mm -hmm. middle of the game. And I have an idea. I'm not going to talk about it because it's first of all, it's someone's uh, personal life and part other other parties that I'm not sure if I'm right about it. But I have some thoughts about it. And as I'm talking to you right now, and what, what if I'm wrong? I could be wrong. So there's a lot of hit and miss in here. And I'm doing this online, so I'm not there with the kid. I cannot just talk to him, see his body language. So there's a lot of layers of education, psychology, uh, micro expressions, all of that is involved, which makes it thrilling, but in the meantime, also demanding. So there's one good thing. Sorry, just say there's one good thing. My job, I have hundred percent job satisfaction when it comes to the, my pay. I I believe every cent I get paid, I deserve it. That's a very good feeling to have. But yeah. okay, when you're working many hours, it can drain you, and sometimes things slip your mind because when like first class you feel better but when you get to the fourth class in a row you may be tired and things can slip your mind and sometimes it may or may not affect the, the outcome eventually but you sometimes can uh, you end up thinking that, oh what if i hadn't missed that one or if i had missed something so there's there is that as well too i'm not saying it's like perfect but there's that i was gonna say that's why chess is life like you were saying this is like there are so many layers of psychology and sociology and then cultural barriers. And I'm like, we are talking about coaching somebody for chess. Why should we think about all these aspects? But I remember a, a, maybe a phrase that we passed around before that like chess is life. It, it just now makes so much more sense. Like you have to know a lot of the things as you're playing it, as you're coaching somebody. And as you're even watching somebody playing chess, like you have to consider all those things that goes through their mind, what are some of the challenges when you're approaching the parents of these kids? Like, 
what 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 do they usually need like from their kids to like just succeed in the games or do they think of chess as like another thing in that kid's life yeah they just think of it as an extracurricular activity they they cannot see like that i don't expect that and besides i i am i'm charging per hour so i just have to give that hour and maybe i give maybe 10 15 minutes extra time about writing emails or giving them feedback over the phone if the kids really are working hard like if if i see that the kid is really immersed in the game and and you know when you have a high volume of students and i'm talking for me uh near 50 students on, online in groups and uh, private so that's a lot of people to manage mm -hmm. yeah that's a lot of people to manage well most of them are in the group lessons so group lessons are easier you just you know you send one email like explanation one and explain for 20 30 people in, in two or three emails so that's easier but the other 20 20 some students that are individual that is makes it uh harder and uh and you only have as much time and that's where I wish I could. One of the things I'm really thinking about is that if I could train an AI to think like me about, about people, because moves you can get anywhere. It's not about that. People come to me for my experience, for the, this pain I'm sharing with you, actually. This, okay. this very thing I'm talking to you in this, in this conversation, this podcast. Other than that, if they are coming to me and say, oh, I can learn the same thing paying someone else this much, I say, well, go figure. Because you are here for my life experience. You're not here for the moves I'm showing you only. Of course, okay. I'll show the best possible path in training, but there are 200 other people who can do the same thing. But what makes me interesting for that job or makes me a good, uh, good fit for your, for your son or daughter is that I have a matching experience or I have a befitting experience with your, with your kid. And that's one thing that parents wouldn't get it. And uh, sometimes they just... Like I always tell them, don't sit in your kid's class. And some parents do that. They want to make sure their kids listen. I said, well, you do that. You're just taking the joy out of the kid's life. Mm. But they do that. So because I am paid by them, I cannot, I have no control over them. And I want to get to the point that I'll become uh, so well established in, in my work in terms of financial success. People say, why you're so, so important to you if you have such, such a high job satisfaction. Because I want to get to that point that my dependency comes down so much that if I see that behavior, as you said, it's either my way or highway. Because you cannot inflict pain on your kid. And I'm not mm. saying any of these parents is willing or wishing to do that. Of course not. They're good parents. They're putting their hard-earned money into chess for their kids. So I'm saying they're good parents, but they are inadvertently are causing pain to their own kids. Interesting. It, yes. It's it's so it, now now the dots are so much more connected. Uh, to me, as far as like you, you being familiar with that pain, probably better than anyone in chess, you know, this pain that you're like, you know what, don't worry your kid or your uh, team player in the national teams that you're coaching here and there, like they're going to win some game, but all what they need to learn from me is the art of being okay with losing it's the art of how to manage all these losses and how to learn from them and let me handle improve, that yes and improve over time like they're not going to be grandmaster overnight and maybe they shouldn't be grandmaster but they should learn how to play chess and how to live life well and i'm gonna do that because i know that pain so let me do that and don't put all the pressure of like because probably if you're consistently watching them while they're playing, it may put some pressure on them that they have to win or they have to do the right thing. But maybe because chess is an art, in your opinion, in your perspective, maybe sometimes they should not make the right move by the book. They should actually have the gut to make calls that might not be right in the beginning, but it's going to change their game for a better. So it's it's interesting like how to see this as a, loop that you kind of like delivered in your story and what you're doing today i'm i'm frankly like understanding why you're coaching these days so heavily i'm understanding it so much better and where that passion comes from what are some of the other things that you do besides uh, coaching for chess these days i'm uh, i kind of want to know where folks can actually find you if you're writing a blog or book or anything we'd love to know uh, if there are other activities you do I do want to do those things, and uh, writing is my really passion. I have co-authored two chess books, and I really have a few other non... Well, they are chess-related, but not like 
technical chess writings uh, work to do. But I have one project. I'm not going to divulge the content of the project because it's a chess project and uh, I'm touching things that I know I'm really good at. So I know what I will write regardless of how it will be re uh, received by, it will be received financially well, but I'm just saying how it will be received, it will work because it's a very important contribution to the chess history. I have that one in, in mind and some other ones. I really need to make the time to make those contents and uh, that will be my legacy for chess. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of working, uh, coaching and a lot of things, uh, financial needs because, you know, sometimes you just have to teach because you have to because, you know, you want to make sure that uh, I'm trying to get ahead now so that maybe like, for example, in December, I have more time because it's like the new year and there are more off time so I can maybe work more more days on, on the projects I like to work on. So, yeah, I have I have uh, those ideas in mind and people say, oh, you know what, put one one page at a time there and I understand that. I understand that but there's one thing. Writing in a second language is not that easy so that's one one hurdle a second hurdle is that when the work is extremely cognitive and you are drained by the end of the day and mm -hmm. you have anxiety and everything and you have to work like hours on yourself to just fall asleep and that's i have to I, this is the reality of my life I have, I have chronic anxiety i am handling it but you know it could affect my sleep you know i need to work out i have to also take care of the body so that the body can take care of the business Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, it's a back and forth between the body and the mind that you know you kind of have to, they kind of have to feed each other and it's so funny that how com complementary they are and in the meantime how they are different entities while they are kind of coming one piece. Um, yeah, um, I have these things in mind which I want. I want to start a Substack. Not that one I could share. I want to start a Substack and start writing in, in Substack, but I, that one I've been lazy about. That one I have been lazy about. But this other project, I really need to kind of create the framework in my head and just sit there and go, go through it. Hopefully that will happen. I think you're already by, I mean, I can I can say that, that by doing this podcast and creating this awareness about what you're dealing with and why you're doing what you're doing today, hopefully it not only allows other folks to speak up about what they are dealing with a similar situation, also it encourages folks to put those pain into such beautiful uh, things that you're doing today, like training kids so that they can be in much better place that they could potentially be. So you're already uh, giving a lot back. Uh, you mentioned a, f a few things that you're doing to take care of your mental health. Uh, I think it's also a great call out for folks with your kind of uh, role that, they, as you said, like there's a lot of cognitive pressure on you day to day. Like you wake up, doing chess and teaching chess and like thinking about chess consistently, it's such a cognitive pressure on you. So as we know, like the relation between the mind and body, you said it so well, like it's putting a lot of pressure on your body. So you, you need to also like take care of that. I want to know, like, as far as your mental health, what are some of the things and routines that you have to take care of your mental health? You mentioned therapy. Uh, if there are anything that you want to call out specifically, if there are anything that you find so valuable, we want to know a little bit about that as well. Well, uh, one thing was that I learned about my ADHD. So I am that one I'm going head on. I didn't know until last March that I have ADHD. So, uh, and it was always causing me some sometimes self loathing thoughts that, oh, I'm unworthy. I don't know why I'm so uh, lazy and not working. And then I realized, wait, oh, hold on, hold on. If that's the case, and that's why you can hyper focus on something, but then, you have a hard time running simple errands. That means that you have to kind of find the balance and then take care of it and you can blend them all in. So there's a solution. So that one I am taking care of it um, through medication as well as the anxiety. But okay, to support the anxiety, I go to, to the gym. I uh, have a support group of friends, which I talk to them. I'm very appreciative of that. Like these are people that I just text them. Look, I feel anxious. Can you talk, talk to me in the next 20 minutes? And they get back to you. And I'm very, very fortunate about that. Wow. Uh, I am being uh, open-minded and uh, spoken about it uh, because having anxiety or having, I don't know, ADHD or depressed is not, is like a disease. It's not, doesn't make me a bad person. It's like if, if you have, if you have, uh, if your liver is not functioning well, it doesn't make you a bad person. But if I were not taking actions about it, which in this case, if someone has liver uh, dysfunction, their liver is dysfunctional, but they keep drinking alcohol, that makes them a 
irresponsible person. So I, now I know I'm aware about it. I'm taking actions to the extent I can. And that puts me at ease with my issues. And it's not under the rug. I go head on with it. It's not anymore under the rug. There are bad days, of course, but most of it are good days. And it's keep getting better and better. Yeah. Yeah. Because and... it's progress, not perfection. I can I can say that I I know we've been uh also like in touch for almost a year again like I, we kind of like disconnected as we both immigrated uh and I I can totally see what you're saying like there are bad days there are good days and uh salute you from here like uh admitting and like talking about these things so openly I know I'm not the only one you talk to about these things uh and this is great to see like you're motivating also folks like me to talk about these things. So just wanted to salute you from here for what you're doing. And now, again, uh, in my in my view, you're taking that uh, pain that you've experienced, the pain of keep putting your pain under the rock. You're taking that, you're realizing it for yourself, you're helping others and activating other people around you. So thank you for that. Um, if, if there is like, specific approaches you're taking, like beside therapy, what are some of the other uh, kind of like mental health uh, management techniques that you may have on day to day? Right now it's workout, therapy, as much medication I need and not more than that. It's very important not to over medicate yourself also, I believe. You should not deny science, but also you should not take things that could, could, could harm you. I've had that experience back in Iran actually. So mm. I took a break from that. I, I, I was resisting any form of medication for 14 years. And then I realized that, you know what? There's nothing wrong with taking medications if you have things like, and that is started with ADHD because that one, there's no other way. You have to take medications for it. Mm. And then and then I became more open about, uh, you know, maybe I can at least give you the, give you the shots, you know, medication. So ter therapy, medication, and uh, working out, you know, physical activities, things that make me, serene and happy yeah lovely so usually um as part of our show we would ask our guests to introduce an activity that they would be open an activity that's good for folks mental health uh that uh, they would do for 30 days uh so do you have an activity that you would like to do with our audience for 30 days it can be as simple as walking x thousand uh, steps a day or meditating for one minute or anything that you would like to be doing with the audience? I'm sure. I don't know. Uh, maybe I think push-ups is some of the things I don't do enough. Maybe 50 push-ups a day. 50 push-ups a day. We sign you up for that, Elshan. So uh, if anyone wants to join Elshan's for... I should, be able to, I should be able to do 100, but I said 50 because I'm lazy. Well, I said lazy. Some days I, I don't do enough, but... Uh, the number 100 sometimes could I wake up in the morning I don't feel uh, so well so I put 50 that I will do 50 I sh I'm sure I will do 50 because I don't want to be a hypocrite that push others to do something I cannot do myself yeah no I, I, I love that actually I I cannot do like 50 every day so this is a this is a good thing for me to catch up and do, make it a 50 a day uh, I've been doing it on and off recently, and it's fun when I can do it. But 50, I think, is perfect. So we sign you up for that. If you want to join uh, El Shan for uh, 50 push-ups a day for 30 days, this is a fun challenge to be at. Um, so as as we are... Oh, go ahead. How do you keep me accountable for it? Huh? That you, you, do we do a log or something? How do we do, how do, we do it? Accountable? Or how, do, how do we do it? Yeah. I mean, so... I want to say that I'm actually doing it. I'm not just saying it. I want to show that I'm actually doing it. Well, this is actually a good way that to ideate on it. Like I think if with your campaign, if we have people joining, uh, we sign them up, we all start at one day together and why not? Maybe we can start and submitting those push-ups by posting on social media or if you want to just record it on a spreadsheet together, like the few of us that we do it, we can just like put how many we did on every day. So we all know this is a community that we are doing this together. What do you think? Do you, do you have an idea of how to record it? I once joined, uh, joined one of these uh, causes. It was for the uh, for, for hospital for children who had cancer. And doing that was like for raising awareness. But I didn't keep up. I, it was 100 a day and I went for five days only, unfortunately. But uh, it, it, it was very meaningful and it was very 
calming, you know, you feel like you're taking part in something bigger than yourself. And it, mm-hmm. it, felt, it felt very fulfilling and humbling. Uh, frankly, I'm I'm a big fan of this. I don't know if you know Elshan uh, in uh, my Farsi community for my meditation podcast. Every once in a while, we have like m- mindfulness and activity challenges. For example, 10 minute meditation, 8,000 uh, steps a day. That's kind of like the uh, challenges we run. And we uh, used to capture a lot of those activities by Telegram, like to rule like a Telegram channel we had. We recently launched a 10-minute app uh, that is now taking care of all of these things for that Farsi community. Uh, I'm thinking, and now as brainstorming live on this podcast with you, I'm thinking that potentially we can bring the same uh, functionality into our Ally Show challenges. So hopefully folks can actually take part and record what they're doing and see that X many other people are doing it at the same time with them. I think to your point, it just brings a unique sense of community and something beyond uh, ourselves, uh, which I love to create. So thank you for uh, sharing that and uh, asking that question about this. Um, As we are kind of like getting to the end of our show, I'm wondering if there is any part of the story, any part of the conversation that you had in mind that maybe left out or anything else that you want to be sharing about your story or any of the topics we talked? Um, Not specifically. Thanks again for having me. I'm really happy that I can talk about this with, with, with folks and people. And, uh, I feel, uh, uh, I feel dealing with pain. The very first part is to be able to share it. And I think this, this possibility of being able to share uh, your experience could, could immensely benefit others. And I think open the door for others to deal with their pains by, sh- by finding those people with the, who they, uh, trust and share with them. So keep up the good work. Thank you. And as you, uh, said it. I mean, the, your story kind of uh, exemplifies and echoes why this show exists. We want the stories under the rug to be out and everybody who's comfortable coming and sharing those stories and hopefully by sharing those stories, others feel uh, that freedom uh, from those pains. And also maybe that encourages others to do the same in their own life with their own community. So uh, thanks again for coming to the show. I hope everybody enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Elshan, if if people want to get in touch with you, what are the best ways before we end the show? What are the best ways for them to be in touch? Um, They can go to my website, gmlshan.com and send an email to the contact. It's Or it's just uh, chess at gmlshan.com. Just send me an email and that's very easy to get in touch with me through that. Lovely. Lovely. And I know you're also on Instagram. I'm going to share those resources as well so people can follow and see the videos and stuff that you're sometimes posting from those uh, chess activities that you have. They're fun. All right, buddy. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks again for joining and have a good day. You too. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.